Okay, so 6.6 .6 is about hormones, homeostasis, and a little bit about um, the reproductive system. So basically, this is the endocrine system where you will learn um, the different glands and the different hormones that these glands produces, and also the function of these hormones to regulate the uh, body system. Anyway, just a disclaimer, there's many other hormones in the endocrine system, but in IV, these are the ones that you need to know. So I've listed here, um, uh, kind of organize all of the hormones that you need to know and the function of each. So um, let's look. Let's look at the list quickly, and then I'll focus on the um, diseases, perhaps that are um, hard to understand and you need to remember. So let's start from. So we have here. Trying. I'm trying something out right here. So you have your pancreas producing insulin and glucagon hormone. Then you have your uh, adipose tissue um, releasing your leptin hormone. Then you have your pineal gland in the brain releasing melatonin. Um, and then you have your thyroid releasing thyroxine hormone. The testis and the ovaries releasing your um, reproductive hormones. So let's let's focus on the important ones here um so for the pancreas it produces two hormones insulin and glucagon so you need to review here the structure of the pancreas what cells releases the hormone and how does these hormones regulate the levels of sugar in the blood so let's look at a diagram of your pancreas you can see here the cross section of your pancreas so you cut it and then you look at it from the the top, um, you're going to have a group of cells here in the islets of Langerhans that are made up of different types of cells. So you're going to have to learn and remember the two uh, types of cells for the endocrine system is the alpha and the beta cell. So alpha cells releases uh, secretes glucagon and beta cells secretes insulin. Okay, and how does these two hormones control the level of sh levels of sugar in your blood? So after a large meal, you have obviously increased um, levels of sugar in the blood, and the pancreas will secrete insulin. Now, insulin will travel all over the body, but then you have receptors for insulin in the liver and in your muscle cells. So once the liver cells, um, once the liver cell receptor sends that insulin, um, the liver cells will remove the glucose from the blood and take it in. And inside the liver cells, um, glucose plus glucose plus glucose plus glucose will be bonded into a, poly, into a polysaccharide called glycogen. And the liver will keep all of that excess glucose as glycogen. Okay, it's stored in the liver. Now, if you go fasting, um, you're not going to lose weight right away. Because even if you go fasting, your body still has can have um, supply of glucose. So what happens is, if you don't have glucose now in the blood, the pancreas will secrete the second hormone, your glucagon. Again, gluco will glucagon will travel all around the body, but you have receptors in the liver. So once it binds with the receptors in the liver cells, the liver cells will start to break down that stored glycogen and release it as individual glucose molecules back into your blood. Therefore, you have increased sh blood sugar level. Okay, so the action of the the pancreas, pancreatic hormone, is useless unless there's um, liver that responds to the hormones released by the pancreas. Okay, so for diabetes, there's type one and type two diabetes. Um, for both of these conditions, you have increased blood sugar level. So for the test, you have to differentiate uh, between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Okay, the cause, when is the onset, what are the symptoms, what are the treatment. Okay, so the next organ here, your adipose tissue or your fat cells, um, after a large meal, they start to secrete leptin. And the cells of the hypothalamus have receptors for leptin. So once leptin binds to the receptors in the brain, specifically the hypothalamus, um, the hypothalamus will signal 
and inhibit the body. Did I spell appetite right? Anyway, it will inhibit appetite. So you will feel uh, fuller or you will stop eating. Um, so obviously the condition associated with a hormone problem of leptin is obesity. Um, please should review the experiments done on leptin here. So we have experiments on mice and experiments with human volunteers. So what we've discovered is mice that were injected with leptin had a an obvious decrease in weight compared to um, the mice that didn't have the injections of leptin. And then the next hormone is melatonin produced by the pineal gland. Um, it's in charge of the circadian rhythm. And if you have a problem with the levels of melatonin, then I mean the condition associated with the levels of melatonin that you need to know here is jet lag. Um, so just, just before you sleep, you have increased melatonin production. That makes you feel sleepy. And just before you wake up, you have lower levels of melatonin that signals your body to, um, to wake up. Okay. Then you have your thyroid producing, th producing thyroxine hormone in charge of metabolism. If the thyroid is very active, you have a condition called hyperthyroidism and vice versa. If it's, um, slower, then you have hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, the thyroid is very active, so your, your metabolism is really fast. Um, you will feel, uh, you, you sweat a lot because you, your metabolism produces heat, so you feel more hot. Uh, bulging of the eyes, this is because you're actually, um, there's sudden loss of weight because metabolism works really fast, so your eyes tend to bulge. I enlarged thyroid, obviously, because it's very um, active. Uh, I think the hairpin here just tells you that there's uh, weight loss. Then you have your diarrhea because your gastrointestinal system is also active. And then you can sleep at night, etc., etc. So basically, your body is in uh, hyper mode. Everything's just fast. Your metabolism is fast. And the opposite, just uh, just remember, the opposite is true for hypothyroidism. Okay, so now we go to the testis. Um, produces testosterone. Remember, these three functions of testosterone. Development of um, secondary male characteristic, sperm production, and development of the embryonic gonads. And then the same function um, you need to know for estrogen and progesterone. Um, these are the female hormones now produced by the ovaries. Okay, now let's focus on the menstrual cycle. I think this is the hardest part of 6.6. .6. Uh, the rest you can just read through it, try to remember it. Um, uh, but then the, the menstrual cycle, uh, a little bit hard to understand. So um, let's look at the graph of the hormone production during the menstrual cycle. First of all, you need to know the two phases in your menstrual cycle. So from uh, day one to the 14th day, uh, by the way, day one is your menstruation. So day one of menstruation to the 14th day, 14 days after that, that's your uh, follicular phase. And then the other half is called, called the luteal phase. Now we call this follicular phase because we're focusing on the growth of the follicles inside the ovary. So those are follicles growing until you ovulate it at the 14th day. And this side is called the luteal phase because we're focusing on the presence of the corpus luteum inside the ovary. So you have presence of corpus luteum, this whole phase is called the luteal phase. So there's two ways to understand this graph. First, let's look at the changes in the hormone levels during the menstrual cycle. So first of all, you need to know there's two hormones produced by the brain or the pituitary gland in the brain. It's the FSH, our follicle stimulating hormone, and LH. Now from the ovaries, two hormones are being released, estrogen or estradiol and progesterone. So let's look at the changes in the levels of these hormones. Let's start with FSH, or the green line. So at the, uh, at the beginning of menstruation, um, when you're menstruating in the ovaries, sorry, in the brain, the brain will start 
um, producing FSH. So you have high levels of FSH, which it says follicle stimulating hormone triggers the development of the follicles there in the ovary. And these follicles in the ovary will start to produce estrogen. So the yellow line. Okay, now you have increasing levels of estrogen. This, the high, this increasing levels of estrogen um, inhibits the production of FSH. So as it keeps increasing, FSH now goes down. Okay, it'll keep increasing. And when it peaks, it signals the brain to produce LH. So you have a sudden peak of LH. That peak, sudden peak of LH, simulates the ovary to produce the egg. So ovulation, LH results in ovulation. When the egg is ovulated, what remains in the ovaries are your corpus luteum. And these corpus luteum, these follicular cells, will start to produce progesterone. As you can see here, you have high levels of progesterone. And then at the end of the luteal phase, your corpus luteum will start to dissolve. So you have decreasing progesterone. The decrease of progesterone and estrogen at this point triggers the brain to start releasing FSH again. Then the cycle begins. FSH increase, follicles release estrogen, triggers the brain to release LH, triggers ovulation, and then corpus luteum will start to produce progesterone. And then at the end of the, the cycle, you have low levels of progesterone and progesterone and estrogen triggering the release of FSH again from the brain. Okay, second, you have to, to look at the uh, feedback mechanisms here. Okay, first, FSH increases the ovaries, also, the ovaries start to secrete estrogen, that's positive feedback. High levels of continuous increase of estrogen triggers the decrease in FSH, that's negative feedback. Further increase of estrogen triggers the increase of LH, that's positive feedback. Uh, right after LH, your corpus luteum produces progesterone, so that's positive feedback. At the end of the cycle, both progesterone and estrogen decreases, then FSH increases, positive feedback. Okay, just repeat that whole part of this video to remember where the positive and the negative feedbacks are. Lastly, um, notice what happens to the endometrium. Okay. So during menstruation, um, you have thick endometrium. And then, of course, you menstruate this layer, so it becomes thinner. And then at ovulation, 14th day, the progesterone, look at the shape of the progesterone and the endometrium. So as the levels of progesterone increase, you also have thicker and thicker endometrium. Um, this is assuming there's going to be a possible implantation. However, if there's no implantation, there's no fertilization of the egg, progesterone will go down. And as you can see here, there's thinning again, and you start your menstruation again right here. Okay, um, so, so many things to look at in this graph. Make sure to study the different um, increase and decrease of your hormone, the positive and the negative feedback, and what happens in the ovaries, and what happens in the endometrium. Um, again, FSH, increase of FSH triggers menstruation. Increase of LH triggers ovulation. Okay, thank you.